Okay, so for those of you watching at home, this is the last of the image processing lectures for this uh, semester. And so what I wanted to do on the last lecture was to get a little bit more into what I would call a computer vision problem. So the topic is what's called active shape models. And so a lot of what we talked about in the beginning of class has been, you know, what I would call low-level image processing. You know, pushing pixels around, changing their intensities, calculating gradients, connecting, you know, edges into lines. You know, that stuff I think is, that's the core of image processing, but you're not really understanding what's going on in the image, right? So this lecture is kind of like maybe one step towards what I would call image understanding or computer vision. And so, um, and kind of the, the purpose of active shape models, which is the topic of the lecture, is a different kind of object detection. And so, some of you are doing projects related to object detection. Um, so for example, you have a license plate detector, right? And so, uh, we talked about template-based matching for doing those kinds of problems, where I have, uh, you know, um, so basically not template based. Right, so just as a reminder, template based things, so again, if I was looking for you know, license plates in cars, right, what I might do is I might have a little template that is my license plate, and I might you know, run that across the image trying to correlate it with something that's the same size and has roughly the same content, right? And so that will work pretty well for objects that are basically, I would, call, I would say, rigid objects, you know, things that don't change their shape. And maybe you can get around the fact that the object changes its size, depending on how zoomed in the camera is, by changing the size of the template or changing the size of the image to make, you know, larger or smaller templates. But there are lots of cases where the objects that we want to find in the image are not these rigid objects, right? So for example, you know, suppose that we're looking for faces in an image. And so, you know, you could have a wide variety of, you know, human faces. Maybe not quite this wide, but you could have someone who has a, a wide face or a narrow face, right? This is kind of like Bert and Ernie. Um, you know, people may have different facial expressions. And so if I have a single template detector that I attempt to run across the image, I'm not going to basically pick up all of these non-rigid shapes, right? So kind of the idea here is that this is good for rigid shapes, and this is good for, you know, this is the problem with non-rigid shapes. And so kind of what we want is a shape model that doesn't have a fixed shape, but instead can kind of deform to fit whatever we're looking at in the image, right? So that's going to be a deformable shape template, okay? And so what I want to talk about today is just a very basic algorithm for learning and applying such a template, okay? And so the way that you derive this shape template, so in a license plate example, maybe I would get my candidate license plate by just, you know, cropping out one license plate from a single picture of a car, right? How would I get my deformable shape template? Well, the idea is that I collect a lot of training data. And so what I might do is I take a lot of faces, right? So let me just use faces as a motivating example, although certainly you can use this for lots of other things. So this is kind of a creepy face. But what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so here's like face number one, and then like here's face number two. And so what I might do is use MATLAB or some sort of manual interface to click on corresponding points in these images. And so what I might do is I say, okay, you know, I, there are things that are common to these faces, and I could number these points. Say I take one, two, three, four, and I have the corresponding points over here. And then I could say, okay, maybe the tip of the nose is five, and the edges of the mouth are six, seven, and where the ears meet the head are eight, nine, and so on. So kind of what you're trying to do is you're trying to find common locations that I can put into correspondence between the uh, training data sets. So basically, I establish correspondence for each training example. 
And honestly, this is probably going to be a somewhat manual process. I mean, if I could do this automatically, I wouldn't need an algorithm in the first place, right? So typically, you know, I take a bunch of data and I click on corresponding points, right? And so the result of that is something like this. I have a set of points, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to index these by, this is like uh, the set of points for person J. And I assume that I have the same number of points in every uh, training set, right? So I have the same number of points are in the same order, and this is like the um, you know n feature points for person J. And so I have basically a two n by one vector that corresponds to my data from that person. Okay, and so now what we want to do is we want to learn how are all of these vectors related, right? So say I have, you know, maybe I have 40 points and I have 100 people that I've gathered this stuff from. Now I want to figure out how are these 100 vectors related to each other. And the idea is that what I want, kind of what we're going to do as a preview is I'm going to, instead of describing a person by this list of points, I'm going to try and do what's called dimensionality reduction on this set to make the set of faces parameterized by a lower number of uh, values than these x, y themselves. Okay, so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. It's kind of the machine learning approach to dimensionality reduction. And so the first thing I want to do to uh, make sure that there's a little bit less for the algorithm to worry about is I want to uh, scale and rotate and translate each set of points so that they're all kind of comparable, right? So for example, you know, suppose that this guy here was actually kind of tilted a little bit, right? I want to you know, tilt that guy back so that he can be directly compared to a person whose head is up and down, right? So the first kind of problem is alignment. And so here's a simple algorithm for aligning each of the things. So let's call this algorithm one, alignment. And so simplest thing to do, first of all, so I, want, I need to take care of translation, rotation, and scale, okay? And so simplest thing is translation, so I can translate all shapes to be centered at zero, zero. That's easy. I just look at the mean x, y for every person, and I make sure that that mean is zero, zero. And now I'm going to take one of the shapes as kind of my, you know, what's the word? My gold standard, right? I'm going to try and register everything to this shape. And so let's say fix one shape. And so let's suppose that I call that, um, I'm going to call this, you know, Z1. So here, actually, let me just give this a name. So here, this long vector, I'm going to call Zj, okay? So basically z is this 2n by 1 long vector, okay? And it's made up of each of these points. So I'm going to take one of these vectors and I'm going to scale it so that the length of this 2n vector is equal to 1, right? So all I do is I compute the length of it and I divide by that length and so now I've got, you know, um, kind of a unit vector here. And now I need to figure out how do I scale and rotate everything else to correspond to that guy, right? And so now I'm going to scale and rotate all other shapes um, to align with this shape. And so how do I do that? So there's a couple formulas I'm just going to put down here. So for each person, I'm going to compute the dot product of the vector for person j and the vector for person 1. And I'm going to divide by the norm of the dot product for person j squared. Okay, so I compute this simple dot product. And then I compute, uh, this one's going to be a little more complicated. So here, this is kind of 
again, a relationship between the person, I should have done it like this, let's call this I. So I'm going to take I from person J and Y from person 1. And I'm going to take I from person 1 and Y from person J, like this. And again, I'm going to divide that through by this thing. So, sorry, this is definitely an I here. So here, this is just basically saying I do some manipulation between the x and y coordinates of person j and the x and y coordinates of person 1. And then the magic formula is to scale by taking this number and my theta is going to be this number. And this tells me how do I apply, how do I scale and rotate the stuff from person J to align with person number one. And so the way I would do that would be to say my new values for um, person J would be scale and rotate the original points from that person. So after I do this process, I am going to end up with a set of xy points so that everything is kind of roughly on the same scale and, and roughly the same rotation. And so this is called uh, Procrustes analysis. And so I thought Procrustes was probably like some Greek guy like Archimedes or something like that. Turns out that Procrustes is a guy from Greek myth who was a, uh, I think he was a bandit. And so he would, tie, he, was, he would tie his victims to an iron bed and he would either chop off their limbs or stretch them so they fit the bed, right? So this is the yeah, same idea is that we're trying to scale and stretch the uh, data to fit with what we want, right? So now you know. I didn't know that until I looked up. Okay. So now we have basically, um, now let's say we have uh, S sets of aligned uh, training shapes. Okay, so what's next? So now, you know, each is described by a a 2N vector of feature points. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to reduce the dimensionality of this set, okay? So instead of having, you know, so, so here's an example of why I want to do that, right? So clearly these two n points are not all independent, right? So what I mean by that is that it's not like these points can be randomly distributed across your face, right? So clearly, you know, points one and two and three and four are all going to roughly have the same, you know, uh, row in the image, right? Uh, and they're going to be, you know, your row, you know, nose five is going to be roughly centered between the eyes, right? So it's not like these two end points can be randomly distributed. There's a lot of correlation between these points, right? In fact, you know, the idea is that probably I could describe these points with a lot less than, you know, two n numbers if I kind of exploited this correlation. And so that's exactly what we're going to do is, you know, um, we want to reduce the dimensionality of these vectors of this set to um, a number, let's call it k, which is a lot less than 2n. Okay. And so the core idea that I'm going to use today is what's called principal component analysis, okay? Which is a simple idea. Anyone ever heard of this before? No? All right. So this is new to you, is it? So the core idea is principal component analysis.
also known as PCA. And here's the basic idea behind PCA, right? So let's, you know, so these, these you know, feature points live in some super high dimensional space. It's kind of hard to visualize what's going on, right? So let's talk about things in two dimensions, okay? So let's suppose that I have a whole bunch of feature points like this, okay? Now I'm drawing these pretty regularly. I could have some extra dots over here, but fundamentally, you know, I look at these feature points and I say, okay, you know, I have a cloud of points in this 2n dimensional space. Now, in this case, I'm just going to suppose I have like, you know, Cartesian coordinates x and y. Now, my hypothesis is that I can take these points and I can describe them with less than two numbers, right? Because clearly, if I look at this data, there's really one direction where the data varies a lot and one direction where the data varies very little, right? And so, if I was only allowed to give you one number to describe these points, what would the right number be? And so what I could do is I could say, okay, well, if I were to, to kind of pencil in this line here, right? Now, that line is the direction along which the data varies the most, right? And this line here, kind of perpendicular, is the direction where the data isn't varying very much at all, right? So let's suppose that I fundamentally think about this as a change of coordinates, right? So instead of calling x and y the axes I want to talk about my data, instead I talk about this v1, v2, okay? And if I only gave you one number, the number that would make the most sense would basically be, you know, the projection along v2. Right, so for example here, I could either describe this point as, I'm going to call this vector here, I'm going to call this point here mu. So I could either describe this point as x, y, or in a different coordinate system, I could think about this as um, mu plus some number, which I'm going to call like b1, right? And since I guess this point is exactly on the line, I don't have any v2 component, right? I could, I could have drawn this point instead. So the idea would be, if I only gave you one number, then I want to choose the, the direction in which the data is varying the most, right? That will give me the most bang for my one number, right? I won't exactly be able to describe the data if I'm throwing away that extra dimension, but I will get a lot closer than if I was just to tell you like the x coordinate, right? So this is the fundamental concept behind PCA. I'm going to, I'm going to draw this a little bit better in just a second. So let me tell you what the algorithm is. So the algorithm. is the following. So first I compute the mean of the data, which I'm going to call mu, and that's just going to be, you know, I have s samples, and I'm going to just uh, average those samples. Again, now, now this is a z is my, is my vector. Now I'm going to compute what's called the covariance of the data. And that's going to be called sigma. I guess I switched my I's and J's, doesn't really matter. Right, so here, this is a 2n by 1 vector. This is a 2n by 2n matrix. And this is basically, if you guys remember probability, we talked about covariance matrices in the context of joint random variables, right? And so here, this is like the covariance matrix that I get from uh, this 2n dimensional random variable. And here, this guy is what we use to make sure that that estimate is unbiased, meaning that if I were to take the expected value of this, I'd get the actual covariance if everything was distributed according to, say, Gaussian distribution, okay? So I compute this 2n by 2n matrix. Then I compute the eigenvalues of the matrix. And the eigenvectors that go along with them. So I'm going to compute some lambdas and some vectors 
And these lambdas are going to be sorted so that they are in decreasing size. And the eigenvector eigenvalue relationship is basically saying that if I take sigma times vj, it's the same as lambda j times vj, right? And so it turns out that these v's are going to give me these dominant directions, okay? And the lambdas kind of tell me how important is that direction. And these lambdas are going to sort, be sorted from greatest to least. And so what I do is I look at these lambdas and I can kind of say, okay, well, um, each eigenvalue Uh, lambda j gives the variance of the data in the direction vj. And since all of the uh, eigenvectors are orthogonal, that means that I can compute the total variance as the sum of these eigenvalues. And so finally, I can say, OK, well, how do I decide, if I've got this high dimensional space, how do I decide how many dimensions I can squeeze this thing down to? Well, kind of what I do is I say, well, how many of these eigenvectors do I need to make up, for example, 99% of the variance of the data? And it turns out that typically I don't need that many eigenvectors at all. So now what I could do is say something like, um, I can choose the k largest eigenvalues to account for, say, p percent of the total variance. That is, I want to choose k so that when I sum up the first k eigenvalues and divide by the total variance, I am at least, say, 99% or 95% or whatever. Okay. So now I've kind of boiled things down to k eigenvalues. And so now <clears throat> we can approximate any of the original shapes, let's call it z, as I take z equals the mean plus, so let me kind of explain what this means. So here, this is a 2n by 1 vector. The mean of the data is also a 2n by 1 vector. This b is going to be a k by 1 vector, where k is much smaller than 2n. And this p is going to be a 2n by k matrix. And so if I write this kind of with shapes, this is like saying that I have my z is equal to some long vector plus, hopefully, some very skinny vector times these b's. And so what, what goes in here are the eigenvalues from the covariance matrix. And so this is good because this says that now to specify a shape, instead of just using, or instead of using these 2n numbers, which could be very large, instead I only tell you about these k numbers here, and then I turn that into a 2n vector by basically combining these eigenvectors and adding back the mean. And that's exactly the kind of picture that I was showing before, right? So let me just redraw that picture. So. In the previous example, that's like saying that, um, you know, to get to this point here, what I would do is I would say, okay, um, I could describe this like x comma y, or I could describe it like, suppose these were the eigenvectors that I learned, and let's suppose this was the mean. I could describe it as saying, you know, go b1 in this direction, and then go b2 in that direction. And the idea is that maybe I discover that actually I don't need this second eigenvector to do a good representation of my data, right? So then I kind of approximate my data 
by projecting it down onto the closest thing I can get by combining the k eigenvectors that I have. And so the k-dimensional um, vector b um, defines a small number of parameters. for the deformable shape model. And this is good for us because that means that if I'm trying to fit this model to a new image, I don't have to estimate all of these two end positions independently. Instead, what I have to do is estimate these values of b, and maybe I only have a few of them. And that means that you can think about this as like I'm given these knobs turn, which correspond to changing the values of b. And what I'm trying to do is I'm kind of trying to tune in these values on these knobs to fit my model to the, to the shape as best as I can, right? So once I show you a couple examples of this, this will become a little more concrete. But this is good because um, it's easier to change a few numbers than it is to change a lot of numbers. So for example, maybe I have 40 people and I have 100 feature points and I boil it down to you know, three numbers instead of what would have been 200 numbers, right? This makes the shape model a lot more manageable. And so choosing B produces a kind of candidate shape. And I'm trying to now figure out, okay, well, how do I find the best B to bring my shape onto the person that I have, okay? And so actually maybe let me show you a quick example from face detection to make it clear kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. So this is not my work. This is from uh, CMU, I think. So here's the idea is that you know, these blue dots may be the x, y positions of, you know, you can see they've got the corners of the eyes. Actually, it's more than just the corners. It goes around the eyes, the shape of the nose, and the mouth, right? And then what you're going to see is that as, when I press play, you'll see the kinds of shapes that this model can produce. And here, they're particularly interested in looking at head pose, right? So actually, their shape model is looking at not just um, straight ahead faces, but also different versions of faces. So the idea is that as I tune the values of B, I get different shapes. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fit that shape model onto my image as if it's almost like a mask, right? And so you can see that the, the shape model starts in some kind of arbitrary position, and then it kind of snaps onto the, uh, snaps onto the person, right? And so this is what we're trying to do is how do I turn these knobs to automatically fit? And so you can see in this case what they were trying to do partially was estimate pose direction. So you can imagine that now they could use this to determine what direction the person was looking or kind of generally are they a you know, skinny you know, up and down, like this guy's got kind of a more up and down face, this guy's got more of a round face, right? And then you can imagine you could do things like automatically snap that to a person as they were moving their head around in real time and then maybe you could do things like lip reading automatically, right? And so here you can kind of see that the way that the mask is changing gives you some sense that there are a low number of parameters that are controlling the position of this blue mask. And so now what we want to do is figure out how do we actually look, how do we actually snap the mask to the person's face, okay? So um, let me just kind of summarize what I just said. So uh, choosing B. Uh, corresponds to um, a candidate shape. Um, we can think about, you know, um, the small set of um, values in the B vector. are like, I like to think about these as like knobs that we can turn. To get the best fit. And the question is, how do we do that? That's going to be the next algorithm. And the, the other thing that's interesting is that the modes, which are the vectors, the eigenvectors, the modes of the V1 through the VK are often intuitive. 
by which I mean, you know, maybe for a big data set of faces, um, they may correspond to You know, so mode one may correspond to like person shaking their head. Mode two may correspond to person nodding their head. Mode three may correspond to how how smiley I am, right? So the idea is that oftentimes you can, if you just kept everything equal and turn the knob back and forth in one of the modes, you see this kind of natural variation in the image. You say, oh yeah, that's that's a that's a direction of that's a direction of variation that I'm used to seeing in people's faces, right? So if you do it for hands, for example, maybe the hand shape modes correspond to, you know, fingers spreading and coming together, right? Um, so this is not always true, especially as you get down to the lower modes, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, what's going on. But for the most part, you know, they could correspond to, at the first few modes, something that you could say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you can't really force the modes to do what you want, but you may be able to observe something there. Okay, so now the next question, the big question is, how do I take my, you know, my model now, my knobs, and fit them to an actual new image, right? Because so far, there was nothing actually very imagey about this, right? So if you look at this, there was no pixel intensities or anything like that involved in this process. All I was doing was I was choosing locations in the image, right? And so now I figure out how do I snap that onto the person. And so that's the, the last of the algorithms. So, um, so fitting a model to the data, to new data. OK, so first, we're going to assume that I know some points that I want to match to. So this is kind of like a chicken and egg problem, right? So let's assume that I assume we have a 2n vector y and we want to fit the model by which I mean I want to find the uh, best translation rotation scale so I have T, S, and theta, and model parameters B. OK, so kind of what I want to do is I want to minimize the difference between my original vector and what I would get if I picked some B, right? So again, this is like the, you know, free parameters, and this here is going to be, the M part is like the rigid motion part, where I have a scale, a rotation matrix, and a translation, right? So this is like saying, you know, first I create the model deformable part, and then I, you know, kind of resize it and rotate it to try and snap it onto the image, okay? And so here's the basic idea. Well, the natural thing to do is to kind of start from the um, the mean shape. So here's the algorithm. So algorithm three is matching the model to the target. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize b equals zero. That is just resulting in um, here the way that the model works is that I generate the model this was my formula from before I take the mean shape plus the modes times B initially since B is zero all I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the mean shape right so I kind of put the mean shape down on the image then I find my best scale, rotation, and translation. And this is just, you know, the algorithm that we talked about in the beginning. This is the Procrustes algorithm, right? So I can kind of find the best scaling, rotation, and translation to bring those things together. Now that gives me a new y. So um, 
this gives new y. Um, then I project y into the x space. So I kind of now put this is like I'm saying bring the rotation and translation scale back to be compatible with x. And then I project those points onto the model. which is kind of just undoing this part. I find the next set of B that seems like it works. And then I iterate. <coughs> until I kind of stop changing, right? So it's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple system, right? All I keep on doing is I, I start with the choice of B. I see, you know, okay, well, for that choice of B, what's the best rigid motion that aligns these things? Now I've got a new set of Ys, because first I kind of started with my original data. Now I basically am kind of moving these Bs around to align the, you know, kind of align that mask to the image in this iterative fashion, right? And so there's kind of the seesawing back and forth between the original space and the model space. So I keep on kind of going back and forth on this. And so it's not hard to implement this yourself to kind of, that's the same thing as what's happening when we see that you know, mass kind of converging. The only thing that we don't really know is, you know, how do we know what the target should be, right? So kind of here, I'm assuming that I know what my original points were. And in practice, I don't know what points should be on that model in the first place. So how do we know How do we know what image points y should belong to the model? That's the chicken and egg part, right? How do I know where the corners of the eyes and the nose and the mouth are, right? And so one thing that we could do is we could use the image edges to kind of pull the model onto those points, right? So for example, let's suppose that I have this model boundary, okay? And really the model is made up of a bunch of, you know, points. These are like the two end points that define the model. So I could imagine connecting them up into a closed curve. And then what I could do is I could say, okay, well, my hypothesis is that the way I chose these points in the first place hopefully correspond to you know, edges of the image, right? Like my corners of my eyes and the you know, corners of my head and so on. All that stuff kind of hopefully corresponds to some sort of image difference. And so what I could do is I could try and say, okay, given this point, I want to know what is the image point that belongs to it. And maybe the image edge is not exactly aligned with the model, right? So maybe here, this is like the you know, image. And what I could do is I could say, okay, for this point, I could compute the uh, normal to the model boundary. And I could kind of search along that normal until I hit a point that has a high gradient, right? Under the hypothesis that I want to kind of find an edgy point that is close to my model in this direction. And so basically, um, you know, search along this normal to find an image point with a high gradient. And in that way, hopefully, I kind of will hit some image structure that pulls the model onto where I want it to go. And so putting it all together, this is like the full final algorithm is what's called the active shape model. So finally, this is almost the end. How does the whole thing work? So first I initialize my shape model is got no, deform no deformal parameters and my 
initial guess is just the mean shape. Now I search around each point on the mean shape for the best nearby image point yi. So okay, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find some, some points that are close by the mean shape that are edges. And then I fit my new parameters which are the scale, the translation, the rotation, and the deformal part to this set of y's. That's algorithm three. That tells me how do I find the best match of the model to my image. And then, uh-oh, alert. Then I enforce, so one thing is that, you know, one thing that you'll find sometimes is that it's possible that when I project a shape onto the model that it may have values on these eigenvectors that are really big, right? So kind of the way I think about this is that the, um, the projection onto each eigenvector, you can think about this as kind of like a multiple of standard deviations, right? So it's like saying that, you know, most of the data should be within three, you know, like within three standard deviations along each eigenvector. And so the idea is that I would maybe have a step that says enforce some sort of constraint that each of these deformable parts has to be kind of within three standard deviations of the corresponding eigenvalue. And kind of one reason for that is that you maybe want to keep your shapes to be kind of reasonable. You don't want them to look that much different than your original data. And then you just iterate, right? So after you do this, I have you know a new shape and I keep on doing this and hopefully eventually things will snap together. The hardest part is, you know, kind of this part, which is making sure that the model is drawn to the right places in the image. And it may be not enough to expect that it's purely the image edges that are going to make that happen for you, right? Um, so you could do better in this step by not only looking at image edges, or let me put it this way. So we can do better in step two. Which is to say that, okay, well maybe when I select my original image points, what I do is, let's kind of take a you know, zoom in of someone's head here. So you know, maybe I'm choosing some points around here. These are my you know, original locations that my user has clicked on. What I could do is I could say, okay, well, for each of these points, I could draw a line, kind of normal, to the gradient. So at each sample point, I could sample, say, you know, 2m plus 1 um, pixels along the gradient on both sides of the point. So what I could do is I could say, okay, not only I'm going to look at the XY location of this, but I'm also going to look at these pixel values, right? And so for a, you know, for a pixel that's on my hairline, for example, maybe I would learn that at this point I have, you know, light pixels that come from the background outside of my head, and I've got dark pixels that I go inside because that's the color of my hair, right? And maybe at the ear point, I have, you know, kind of flesh tone on both sides, and maybe there's an edge over here at some number of pixels, right? So the idea is that um, for each point, we have both an XY location and a, you know, 2M plus 1 grayscale vector. And then I could do PCA on the whole um, you know, kind of concatenated vector. Concatenated vector. Right, so instead of going back to describing each person by just a bunch of special points, I could also kind of add in 
a whole grayscale vector on top of that, and then I could kind of simultaneously learn how the positions of the points and these grayscale intensities would be expected to change. And that would help me because maybe in this step where I'm trying to search around each xi for the best possible point, then I use my image intensity information to do that, right? Maybe I try to match up the vector that I see across the model with something that's similar in the image, right? I try and bring that, you know, position of the point in to match these two grayscale vectors as close as possible. And so, um, you know, this kind of thing gets more and more advanced. This is like the kind of the simplest version of this algorithm. Um, but this is the basic idea. So that's probably what's happening in, uh, in this kind of image. Again, let me play these again. Is that, you know, I've got this blue mask, but I don't know in this example whether or not there's also some appearance information being used. But I suspect that there probably is because, you know, if you think about the points along the nose line, for example, there is no edge happening along the bridge of that nose. But instead, you know, maybe I would have an intensity model that says that I expect there to be kind of a, a fall off where the nose is brightest because the light is hitting it closest to the camera and then it kind of falls off equally on either side, right? And so this is the basic idea behind, you know, simple deformable templates, right? So this is definitely much different than taking a license plate and kind of correlating across the image. Instead, I have these knobs that I can turn to kind of change the shape and the scale and, and not just the not just the scale, but I can really fundamentally change this, um, you know, how do I want to say this? Let me, let me show you a couple of examples that make this a little bit clearer. So this is her faces. Let me show you one more face example. Um, so here's an example again where I have like a face uh, template. The face is not the same size in all these examples, but it's being kind of rotated, scaled, translated, and then there's probably a little bit of deformability to fit it onto these people. So you see a lot of pictures from like people in, you know, cast shots for TV shows is a common thing for people to fit faces to, at least it used to be, right? So you can see that, you know, here it worked all pretty well. There's a couple people who have no, you know, match. Like this guy is probably not matched because he's got glasses, and maybe there were no glasses people in the training set, and so the thing didn't pick up. And then maybe this woman here is, you know, just not, not clear why it didn't work. Here this woman's face is like, you know, way too big. Um, this person has double face for some reason. This person has a face over in their pant leg, right? So it's not a perfect thing, but I mean, it gets pretty much close to the way 90% of the time, right? So um, I'm most familiar with these shape models because I use them in uh, medical uh, imaging. And so here, this is just a little bit of an example from some of my research related to radiation therapy. And so um, big picture is that when you go in to get treated for cancer with radiation, you usually get a CAT scan. So we talked about CAT scanning in uh, one of those lectures. So that results in something where the doctor has to outline, okay, this is where the organ with the tumor is, and this is where all these other organs are that may be sensitive to radiation. After that, the patient gets treated with, you know, actual radiation from the accelerator. But the, pro the problem is that I've got this CAT scan, and someone has to look at an image like this and decide, okay, you know, these are the organs of interest. So, for example, in prostate radiotherapy, you've got the prostate, the bladder, and the rectum. And that set of three organs you know, someone or something has to sit down and automatically outline that for every person. That could take several minutes, right? Um, and so we're trying to find image processing algorithms that will make that process faster but still be pretty accurate. And so, um, of course, then you have to actually treat the patient. That's a, a harder process. And so here, this is just kind of a picture you can see that the shapes of these organs in 3D could be kind of, kind of complicated, right? You've got, like, this is for lung tumors. You've got the esophagus, the tumor inside the lung, and the heart, and in like cancer that's in your head or in your neck, you've got all sorts of you know stuff that, to worry about, right? You've got um, you know the ears, the cochlea, you've got the eyes, you've got the, the brain stem, the part of the spinal cord that goes into the brain. You've got your jaw, your your larynx. Uh, there's there are these glands called the parotids that are really important. And so basically, you know, some all these things have to get outlined every time you get treated for cancer. And so we thought, why not? We, why don't we apply this shape model to for example, finding prostate images, or finding the prostates in CAT scans, right? And so one thing that we started out with finding out was that, you know, okay, so we need training data, and so we got lots of prostate cancer scans, CT scans from our, from our collaborators at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the first thing we noticed was that the numbers of points, so basically, you know, these come from people of all ages and all sizes, right? And so part of the problem immediately was that 
people have differently sized uh, organs inside their body. So we had to figure out how do we match corresponding points on these organs. And so actually, um, one of the projects that some, one of you guys is doing has to do with kind of resampling organ shapes. So kind of we had one step where we had to figure out how do we interpolate to make sure that every training data that we had was resampled to have the same number of slices and the same number of points around each slice. Um, and then we built the shape model. So here's, a, here's an example of the shape model, and here's what it looked like for the prostate case. So what you're seeing right now is the average prostate across all the patients, and then as we tune, so the, what you're seeing here is changing the values of these B parameters, right? And so here you can see that the, the corresponding changes in shape actually give you some sort of a sense of you know, meaningful variation in the data. So like the first one kind of corresponds to this motion of where the prostate could be inside the patient. The next one is kind of like a left and right motion. The third one is kind of like a scaling. And the fourth one is kind of like a little bit of a, you know, kind of a, whether it's slanted or straight up and down, right? So the point is that this was all automatically discovered by the model, right? And so then you can think about the job of the automatic algorithm is that find the positions of these sliders so that the prostate shape that is generated matches as closely as possible with the CAT scan, right? And so this was work that I did with an RPI professor, Daniel Friedman, many years ago. Um, and this is kind of an example of how that works, where the black contour is what a doctor automatically, or no, what a doctor manually outlined, and the yellow contour is what our active shape model automatically got to, right? And so you can see that even though it's not perfect, it actually matches pretty well. Uh, and so the idea is maybe this is the first step to automatically segmenting the prostate instead of having to spend someone's valuable time, you know, using a stylus to, on that, to, to draw these things on some image, right? And of course, once you've got the single organ model, you could also think about um, how all the organs in the body are, are coupled together, right? So you could build independent models for the prostate, the bladder, the rectum, and try and fit each of those, you know, by themselves. The problem with that would be that you know there's nothing that would prevent your shape models from kind of competing against each other for the same pixel. So you might find that after you do that, you know the bladder and the prostate shapes that you converge to might interpenetrate, right? Because they're independently fit. So this kind of left picture shows that again, there's a lot of variation in how different patients look for these three organs, and then you can build kind of like a joint shape model where again. You can just throw all the points into one big vector, right? The, the shape model doesn't know any better, it just treats it like one big vector. And then you can see the different modes of variation for these three organs simultaneously and use the same kind of algorithm to fit those organs all at once, right? And so here you can kind of see that the bladder is, you know, the red shape is definitely moving around. And then the prostate is kind of, you know, exhibiting some of the same shape changes that we saw when it was being fit independently. And then the rectum is kind of moving up and down. But, but all these organs are kind of sliding together in a way that we've learned is typical of looking at patients in, in the clinic, right? So this is good in the sense that now we can kind of tune these knobs to fit all three of these organs all at once. And that's something else that we did um, for that project. Um, and then there are some more things that we did after that. This is, again, not too different than one of the projects that's going on here where we thought, OK, well, to make sure that when we turn these knobs, the organs don't go into places that they shouldn't inside the body, well, one thing that you can observe is that there's kind of this cage of bones in your pelvis that kind of constrains where the organs can be. And so we improve the algorithm by automatically detecting those bones and drawing these planes, these colored planes, to say, okay, all the organs that you segment have to be in this, you know, in this box defined by these planes. And even here, this is an image processing problem you guys could have handled in this class, right? So here, these are the original CAT scans. And this is almost like a thresholding problem, right? So we threshold these to find where the bones are, and then we do some morphological operations to fill in the bones. And then we do some kind of slice-to-slice uh, -slice matching to be able to keep track of which bone is which, right? So kind of we start with this slice, and that's just like where the CT scan hits your legs. Then we kind of follow the leg bones up to make sure that we keep track of where those are. Eventually, the leg bones kind of fuse into your pelvis, and um, so this is just kind of, I don't want to get into it too much, but basically this is the idea of kind of labeling which bone is which. And we did some more work that was not just a PCA model where I could just have 
knobs that would change the shapes for one patient. But another thing that we thought about was that um, this was an analogy to, you know, thinking about um, variation in both what's called style and content, right? So maybe one way to think about this is that there's a content parameter, and that content could have to do with, for example, is your bladder full or empty, right? That's something that you can kind of make a patient independent judgment about. And there's some stuff that is specific to the patient. So maybe one example is, you know, how do people write, you know, numerical digits, right? So everyone has their own kind of style of handwriting. If I asked you to write the digits from zero to nine, the zero to nine part would be the content, and your kind of handwriting style would be the style, right? So the idea was, could we decompose an organ in terms of both style, kind of like what kind of patient is this, and content, which is kind of like what is the state that their organs are in. So it's kind of like, instead of having a linear row of knobs that controls everything at once, we kind of have two rows, of, you know, a row of knobs and a column of knobs that says, this is what kind of patient it is, and this is kind of what bodily state they're in. And so we're kind of fitting these parameters simultaneously. So anyway, this, this is maybe a little bit far beyond image processing, but it gives a sense that, you know, I mean, the thing that I just taught is something that we used in practice in our medical imaging problem that seemed to work pretty well. Okay, so let me finally conclude with a animated GIF that hopefully will uh, be funny now that you've taken this image processing class. So all, the, the, all you that are working on your projects are probably struggling with the fact that image processing is not as easy as it looks on CSI and so on. Okay, so that's it. So any questions about anything? Yes? For the uh, video where you're doing the face matching, would yeah. that only work with like, that background? Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. So the, the video with the face matching is very constrained, and that's a good observation, right? So here, uh, if I go back to the... Um, if we look more carefully at this, right, you can see how nice the background is in this image, right, and how well lit the people are. So certainly this is benefiting significantly from how clean everything is, right? So this would be much different than trying to snap a surreptitious picture, you know, out of my car window at a face and trying to find it, right? So here, this is almost the best case scenario. Everyone is, like, super well lit. They're, in some sense, cooperating with the camera, right? They're not, you know, too angled far away from it. You notice that I don't think anyone in this example has glasses or facial hair, right? That will definitely make things harder. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, this is really clean data, right? Um, and it works great, but at the same time, real world face images are never quite like this, right? So, and that's the hard part is that, you know, you find how quickly, uh, you know, reality will kind of, and, you know, that's, that's a part of the problem is that, um, you know, I don't think, well, actually, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't claim to say. So a good, a good thing to look at locally at RPI is that Professor G in our department is a big face recognition guy, right? And so, you know, he has very similar demos of, you know, kind of the camera that comes off of your laptop or on the top of your monitor, kind of real-time tracking co points on the corners of faces, and also, you know, kind of estimating things like uh, emotional state, like are you happy, are you sad, are you disgusted, right? Um, and so he would be the better guy to give you a sense of, of what the state of the art is in face. Uh, this is definitely, but this is also many years out of date, right? This is not like the most recent research either. It's just a cool looking video. So, other questions or comments? Okay, so that's it for image processing. So I hope that you enjoyed yourselves.